Each season, summer, fall, and winter, spring, the loft schedules a huge variety of writing classes. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce one of our poetry instructors, Pai Yang Lifang. Pai Yang, could you introduce yourself and tell us how you got involved at the loft? Good afternoon. My name is Pai Yang Lifang. Uh, I got involved with the loft um, many years ago when I used to live in Minnesota. And uh, I I'm, I'm Hmong American. And so I was very much part of the um, Hmong American literary movement that occurred um, in the late 90s, as well as part of the Asian American Renaissance uh, that was taking place in Minnesota. So I had always really enjoyed um, reading, but writing was a different venture. And uh, I really got into poetry writing for two reasons. Um, one, one thing was that my, um, my paternal grandmother passed away and I really felt the need to um, explore her history, which was really my heritage and my history. So poetry allowed me to do that especially because uh, I, um, I'm one of the, um, I guess, first Western born um, Hmong Americans. I was not born in the US, but I was French born. So I, I never really had the chance to live in Laos or even experience the Thai camps. And so for me, it was uh, especially more important to try to, um, to rediscover some of that and understand um, that background and that experience and, and that history. And then the second reason why I got into poetry was really because um, I'm formally trained as an attorney and uh, I, I was doing, um, I guess, social justice work, legal work, um, some pretty, um, I guess, heavy advocacy type of work. And what I realized is that um, it was necessary to find uh, different means of trying to communicate and express certain ideas. Um, and, and try to draw support from uh, different segments of not only my own community, but uh, also across communities for sol solidarity. So poetry for me was uh, one of the ways that um, I was hoping to be able to cross over to, um, to different um, people with different, I guess, values. And, and I think that's one of the, um, that's one of the powers of the arts and especially poetry. Your upcoming class this summer it focuses on exploring history and exploring community, a lot of these big topics that you just mentioned through poetry. And so you touched on this a little bit with what you, you know, your last answer, but what was it that really inspired you to draw this class together for people? As a Hmong American poet and a Southeast Asian American poet, I. I have always been wanting to learn more about um, Southeast Asian American poetry. And of course, it's very new because uh, for example, in, in the Hmong community, we, uh, I'm really only one generation removed from, um, from the generation that did not even have a written language, right? So um, it was important for me uh, both as a Hmong American woman, but also as a Hmong American poet, to be able to, to somewhat survey the, um, the Southeast Asian American poetry that had been created in the past uh, couple of years, uh, and, and look at What, what other uh, Southeast Asian American poets had been expressing. And I was really interested by, once again, the intersection of um, the different um, countries that were involved in the Vietnam War. So Vietnam, of course, and then Laos, and then um, Cambodia as well. Uh, and Hmong and uh, Hmong, the Hmong Americans that are in the US um, mostly came out of, out of that diaspora from um, the Vietnam War after, after Hmong people having served as uh, the CIA secret army and being uh, persecuted because of that allyship or alliance, yeah. And, and so from the Lao uh, diaspora, we really have Hmong and Lao, which is already 
one bridge that we, that we have to cross, but we also really share that heritage as well with um, with the Vietnamese, you know, refugees, and then um, the Cambodian refugees. So at some level, we have um, shared experiences and shared histories, but of course we come from different countries and then um, we experience the war in very different ways. So, and coming to the US, I think our communities also experience becoming Asian Americans and Americans very differently. So I was very interested in exploring both the common commonalities, but also the differences between our experiences and the fact that um, as a collective, we had a body of uh, poetry that could share the, the Southeast Asian American um, experience coming out of the Vietnam War diaspora. And sticking along this theme of community, you've you've been published in a few different anthologies. So how does that communal medium inform your contributions? Right. So, I mean, the great thing about anthologies, of course, is that um, it's almost like a slice in time, right? And a slice in time and a slice in um, certain subjects. And so uh, to be to be part of anthologies, once again, it, it's to be part of um, certain communities, whether it's you know Asian American women uh, or even Minnesota women poets, right? I was in, um, in two of those anthologies, but also by topic. I think what it does is that um, it allows once again for some collective voices to come together and be seen um, in their commonalities once again, and also in their differences. And the fact that um, we may have um, similar experiences, but of course we have different voices, but there are also nuances. Uh, and um, there may be personal nuances, or there may be community and cultural nuances. And so it's important for anthologies to be able to display the diversity within um, certain certain groups of voices. Um, for poets, I think it provides exposure. So out of my being in anthologies, what I what I noticed is that um, um, different people have reached out. You know, maybe educational um, entities or even teachers, and they, you know, they, they have just followed up on, hey, we saw you, we saw your poem in this anthology, and either we are like interested uh, in um, in publishing it uh, in in our materials, or we are already teaching it in our classes, which I think is wonderful because um, when I write my poetry, I think. Um, of course, I think a lot about my family, future generations of my family and my community, as well as the fact that because we are um, one part of the larger American fabric, that we also have to, um, to, to represent our voices and, um, and build the bridges with the other cultures and communities that are part of the American fabric. So, I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to contribute to both the preservation and the recording of um, the experiences from my community, but also the connection with other communities. And I think that anthologies usually do that, which is that your story and your voice is put within a context and uh, within larger communities, which build bridges, connections, and understanding across um, different segments. And that's what we really need at this time when it seems that the US is so divisive. Um, and it's it's been interesting to me um, to see that. Um, so I, I no longer live in Minnesota, but at heart, I feel like a Minnesotan. And I think once a Minnesotan, always a Minnesotan, because we, and that's why in my biographies, I, I always um, say that I'm Minnesota grown, because Minnesota really um, was a place where uh, I was formed professionally, but also uh, as, uh, as a community member and an activist. And so Minnesota is very much part of my DNA, I guess, the eyes <laughs> and the sense of um, volunteerism and um, 
wanting to be helpful in the, uh, in, in the community, right? It's all of those things. So at any rate, um, it's, I think like a lot of Minnesotans uh, on the ground, but also Minnesotans who are no longer on the grounds, it was extremely painful to see um, all the you know racial and social unrest that happened during the pandemic and the fact that as much as much as minnesota really felt like oh we we got it together we have like a great model and we have a great quality of lives but obviously um there were fault lines that um were not visible and under stress they really just broke down and I think as, um, as Minnesotans, um, we really have to think about um, strengthening the social fabric of um, Minnesotan life. And I think poetry and the arts definitely play a great role in rethreading everything and, um, and feeling that we are part of one community and one social fabric. So um, yes, the, the other reason why I really wanted to teach this class at this time was because I felt that um, there needs, especially for Minnesota, there needs to be among Southeast Asian Minnesotans, there needs to be a better understanding of our own heritage histories, um, our own alliances and um, and differences among the different Southeast Asian communities, but also realizing that um, we have common experiences as uh, Asian Americans, Southeast Asian Americans in Minnesota, and uh, our relationships with other communities in Minnesota, whether they're minority communities or the mainstream community. And so the purpose of this class that I'm going to be teaching uh, in July of 2021 is really about uh, not, not only for Southeast Asian um, community members or would be poets or activists who would like to use poetry as, as a way to, um, to build bridges and connections and contribute to rebuilding the social fabric of Minnesota to, to come together and then inviting um, other communities, mainstream communities, to come and join us and also learn more about um, their Southeast Asian uh, American neighbors and the backgrounds that they came from and all of those things. So this class to me felt very timely in so many ways. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is extremely timely for better and for worse. You've been teaching for quite some time and you teach at other institutions as well as The Loft. And so I'm, I'm curious about what brought you into teaching and if your focus was always this idea of building community and building conversations around culture um, or what other aspects of teaching really appeal to you. Right, so I, I really started teaching a little bit in, uh, in, in DC where I currently reside, just because I think, so of course being in Minnesota, I, I was fortunate to have um, uh, uh, both a Hong American and then a, an Asian American writing circle, right? So we, we had a lot of um, Hmong American poets and Asian American poets who knew each other. Uh, some of us would meet and write together. We had a lot of readings, all of those things. When I went to live in California for a while with, with my parents in, um, in the Central Valley, there was also a large Hmong community and I was able to, um, to continue a little bit of that with a Hmong writer, writing circle over there. However, when I came to DC and I, and I was looking for uh, Asian American poets, Asian American writers, there wasn't really anything available and I was always waiting for and, and actually hunting down for um, Asian American poetry classes. And then after a while of doing that, I realized, you know what? I mean, it's um, we may get like one one workshop or you know two workshops a year, and if it's not there, then I should just teach my own because <laughs> because I, I'm probably at a point where I know and I was thinking, yes, I was at a point where I had gone to a lot of workshops and I was actually routinely workshopping with with a group with Split This Rock in uh, in Washington D.C. and I thought, oh, I should just you know. Um, 
decide that uh, I'm, I'm going to create uh, and, and offer um, poetry classes that would focus on Asian American poetry, uh, including, of course, Southeast Asian American poetry. So that's how I got into this. <laughs> And what is it that you hope your students take away from your classes, both your upcoming class, but also just the whole variety of classes that you teach? Yes, so um, what I have come to realize as a poet is, is that, um, is that um, despite everything, I mean, poetry is a progression and it's an evolution uh, as an artist, right? We, we may start, and a lot of us actually in Minnesota started as, oh, we have time and we have an interest and therefore uh, we will be starting to, to write poetry. And, and also, of course, we had things that we wanted to say in our own voices, right? But um, I think the, the first generation of Hmong American writers and poets in Minnesota were not formally trained as, um, as poets or writers. Um, nobody really went to get an MFA or you know, even an English major. And, um, and so uh, for my generation, and, uh, and actually I think quite a, quite a few, um, Poets and writers um, come up not being formally trained uh, in the literary arts, which is a good thing and a bad thing because you know people have said, oh, no, it's sometimes it's great to have an MFA, and then sometimes it it may actually um, interfere with your um, originality and creativity. So it's it's a 50-50 thing. But for me, who really had not gone to an MFA, then I felt that um, we still have to learn craft, we still have to um, refine um, our po poetic expressions and then poetic skills. So um, I feel that an ongoing uh, poetic education um, is necessary um, to, to keep current. I mean, it's like anything, because I think poet, poets, for me, a little bit, you're kind of at the intersection of being a historian, an artist, and a journalist. So, um, so your poetry has to evolve the way that uh, your culture and um, your history and the history of the places in which you live evolve. And so, uh, as part of that, you you have to keep refining your uh, poetry skills. So, yeah, that, that's, what, that, that's what I would say about the value of going to poetry workshops, which is that um, it's an ongoing uh, educational journey. Uh, if you are really serious about, you know, wanting to be uh, the kind of poet that you want to be. And then the other thing, of course, is that um, the additional value of being part of workshops is that um, it's so inspirational and um, helpful actually to be in community when writing because um, I, I belong to, to just a couple of workshops and I would say that I'm always amazed by um, the creativity of other poets, um, the words that they bring to the world. And I think it's, one of the things that also fuel my own creativity and my own inspiration uh, as a poet. So um, poetry is, it's both, I mean, it, it is an individual uh, endeavor, but it's also um, all the interactions and all the influences that you are exposed to. And, and, and I think that uh, when you have um, more exposure, more networks, um, uh, it it also en en enhances your own poetry. Yeah. And going off of your own art as well, you've talked about how your history informs your art and you've talked about how these communities that you found inform your art. Are there other areas of your life that do as well? Definitely. Um, so I, uh, yes, professionally, I think uh, I, I have dedicated my professional life to to social justice. Although I, you know, I've I've, I've worn different hats, um, worked in different sectors, but um, the trajectory the tra trajectory is uh, is consistent in um, in the sense that um, yeah, as 
as a child of uh, refugees, I have always felt very strongly that um, there were injustices and there were rights that needed to be uh, defended uh, and injustices, injustices that needed to be remedied. And so because, because of that interest in, um, in building a better world and uh, enhancing people's lives in whichever way that, that is available um, from different lenses with different skills, um, I think out of that, it also uh, very much um, influences my poetry because poetry once again for me is is another tool in um, in building stronger communities and uh, building a better world and when I see impact I think um, impact doesn't have to be anything big which is why I think once again that poetry is quite a good tool. In fact, it might just be, you know, a little light suddenly coming, coming alive in, in people's eyes because suddenly they may hear one word or one phrase and then it just, there's a tiny shift in the way that um, one sees the world or one sees others. And I think that, um, eventually social change really comes out of that, is uh, the ability of people to perceive others as well as themselves, and then the world in different ways and thinking, is this the kind of person that I want to be? Is this, is, are these the kinds of relationships that I want to have? Is it the kind of world that I want to live in or that, you know, my, my kids or my, for me who doesn't have kids, I think a lot about my nieces and nephews and think about the next generation, um, even though it's not my own kids, but it's still, you know, the kids of our family, of the kids of our community. Um, thinking about the fact that we, we do want to have um, better lives and a better world, a safer world. And a safer world and better lives do not happen in isolation. They really happen um, in, solid, in solidarity and um, in, um, in a circle of interdependence between everyone and every community moving forward together um, and not leaving anyone behind who might be suffering or might be once again the fault line that is going to break and and make the whole society fall down right so so yeah well, for our final question this is a question just to get to know you a little bit better when you aren't teaching or writing, which probably doesn't leave a ton of time, but when you aren't teaching or writing or working, normal job, uh, what can you usually be found doing? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not very athletic, but I'm a gym rat. And um, what I found out is that um, because my mind is so busy and sometimes my brain goes so fast, so it's very useful to have a balance in the physical body as well, because as human beings, uh, we are not only our mind, but uh, our, even our spirit, but we are definitely also our bodies. And so just to have a balance between um, the way that um, the mind works so hard and um, sometimes goes so fast. So uh, you have to also be healthy physically. So out of that, uh, I, I'm also certified as a yoga teacher and uh, I, I came late to yoga and I'm not a really good yogi, but uh, I have also felt that uh, that also brings balance to my life. Uh, and then other than that, uh, I, you know, I, um, I'm definitely a community person. So I'm always involved uh, in, in some type of community event or, um, or a project and um, and when one ends, another one comes along. So I think it's it's uh, once again once you once you're like a, an active community member, it's it's a lifelong thing, and that's definitely something that I learned from Minnesota, from going to the University of Minnesota, and I had a really good mentor who basically shaped me the way that she wanted to shape me, which is to be 
not only to be someone who had you know professional skills and intellectual skills but also somebody who would be contributing to society so uh, i'm very thankful for that uh, because um it's it's something that i have kept uh, throughout my life and and i think it has really shaped um the different paths that i have taken well, for all of our viewers, you can find Paying's classes as well as our full summer lineup by visiting loft.org slash classes. Paying, thank you so much for being here with us today. It was really wonderful speaking with you. Thank you so much, Savannah, for this opportunity. Have a great, a great rest of the day as well.